What? Yes, I, I know about the mic. It's uh, better about comment. <laughs> okay. And uh, with this, we'll start with the... Oh, bandwidth is cool. We, we, we'll start with the usual not well. Uh, not well that the not well has changed. Um, the change uh, still reflects the same rules and BCP 79 um, about patterns. If you're aware of any talking, I should use this one. I can still do noise if I want to. Okay, so if you're aware of any IPR which relates to the work that's being presented here from you, from your company, or even from a third party, please let us know during the meeting or tell the chairs after the meeting. Now, the not well has been uh, improved with a lot more information about, about best practices, in particular, uh, harassment procedures. So, um, well, procedures against harassment, I would say. So if, if, if you're uh, aware of situations or if you live through situations, now you have a link, this Ombuds team link that you can see on this uh, not well page. These are a team of people that you may contact if uh, there is a situation uh, which requires a, a discussion. All the anti-harassment procedures are listed in BCP 25. And then we have a code of conduct and rules about copyrights. And all these has not, are now expressed, uh, presented on the not well as well. So they're all here. Reminder, we will, in 10 minutes from now, because there are always people arriving late, uh, we'll be dis distributing the blue sheets. Um, there will be two blue sheets going from the top of the room to the bottom. Please put your uh, email, uh, uh, name and email in there. Uh, the minutes of this meeting will be taken. The meeting will be uh, recorded and, and filmed. So you will be uh, on TV if you're coming to, to the mic here. If you're coming to the mic, please sit, please stand uh, within this uh, pink uh, square that is on the side here. So, so, so your, uh, your smiling face can be seen on TV and your presence is being logged. If you care, and that would be very nice to participate to the minute taking, we have an Etherpad page. The link is on the screen above. So that's where all the minutes are being taken. So if you, if you, for instance, you came to the mic, said something, and you feel that uh, what was recorded does not really match what you wanted to say, please go ahead and edit. Yeah. It's also a good way to, to track what was just said. If for some reason you could not catch, understand what was just said, maybe the minutes will help you understand. Just uh, say something um, on, on the PDF uh, that we uploaded. It seems that the link um, is pointing to ITF 99. So if you, I mean, the text is correct, but if you click on it, it it leads to a wrong page. So just pay attention if you click on it at 101, like as I, at the ITF. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> and so here are all the um, the links for use by the Jabber participants and the minute takers. And uh, we we thank uh, our Jabber. Uh, that's Edgar, I guess. No? Oh, it's Raul. Okay, how is on Jabber? And, and we have a, a number of minute takers. So thank you so much. And everyone is welcome to participate to the minute taking. Uh, so the agenda for today. So we have a, a, lo a long session and many things to say. So there is this presentation that we are doing now for the introduction. So if you're not happy with um, the agenda, please let us know now. We'll yes, oh, that's true. So I guess we'll, we'll talk about the hackathon right after my talk before we start the meeting. Okay. Um, so we after the presentation, we'll, we'll have a small presentation by um, Dominique about the hackathon. Then we'll go into the um, status of the LP1 overview document, which is uh, in the hands of the ISG. Then uh, Anna and Dominique, who is the shepherd of the document, will present the status of the last call of the static context header compression document. And then we'll go through uh, a number of documents which um, enable the chic compression on various technologies. So Julien will present us chic over Laura one. Then Juan Carlos will show what he's doing on Sigfox. And uh, Edgar, I guess, or Anna, Edgar, 
will present on NBIoT. Then we'll have a common session uh, with uh, Diego and Dominic because there were two drafts, but I hope that we end up with one and we'll see how that goes about some usage of ICM PV6 over LoRa or over LP1s. Then Alex will tell us about the data model, which has always been in our charter, and we'll, we'll, we have not progressed well on that, so we can now take over that work. And we'll discuss about rechartering. Any question, anything? So we probably can start. Um, Okay, so on the um, uh, on the status and where we are since our last uh, time that we that we met. So uh, of course we have two charter items as of today. So we have the baseline technology description, which is known as the LP1 overview, and then the uh, the compression um, uh, draft with, that is the shake over co-op IPUDP uh, so, and uh, yeah shake, shake over co-op and IP and UDP. Uh, so the milestones are, uh, we have managed to advance pretty well from the last time that we've met, from the last ITF, and uh, the uh, LP1 over, uh, overview draft it has been submitted uh, for public uh, to, to the ISG, so everything is working pretty well there, and we are really uh, happy with our, with our progress, the, with the progress that we've made. Uh, the two um, milestones that we have, the two uh, points on which we are working is the document, the draft, uh, shake over IP UDP, and that's the thing that uh, uh, shake for for IP UDP, and that's the main point that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and uh, then we'll be talking about uh, future uh, changes to this um, charter, things to anticipate. So uh, the history, of course, is uh, well known. We have been uh, doing things in a pretty rapid pace. So we had many, many interim meetings to be able to deliver into this uh, in, in, in such a short time frame. And uh, uh, yes, so as uh, as promised, we submitted the LP1 overview uh, to the ESG, and uh, things have been going, going going pretty well there. And uh, uh, Pascal will tell us more about it later. Uh, and uh, today here, uh, we are going to be talking over this, uh, as I said, the main uh, IP, chic for IP UDP, so that will be the main core of the, uh, of the discussions today. And of course, the, 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 the future charter items. So uh, that was the, the history, and uh, now um, uh, Stephen, he asked us to, to step in and to, 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 to Oh, yeah, about the hackathon. Before this, we are going to talk about the hackathon. And uh, so during this, uh, uh, during the, the weekend, just before the ITF, there was this wonderful hackathon and uh, there were many participants. Dominique will tell us a couple of words about it. Uh, I must say that the hackathon is something really important that is getting for the ITF and for the whole community. So I would personally <laughs> encourage you, if you're able to come for the next ITF, the week before that, to come and participate. It is really um, and something that's becoming super important. And the hackathon of LP1 has been there from the start and has really helped us uh, tremendously advance and show how things are done and solve outstanding issues. So uh, thanks, uh, I would like to personally to thank everyone that was part of this hackathon. It was really a great experience. Thanks. Thank you. So ju just for the participant and then I will let you. So I'm, I'm just showing how we basically can easily get access to the documents during this meeting. So if you go to data trackers, ITF, org, meeting 101, agenda.html, which is the link I provided in my email for this meeting, you will find LP1 here. Oops, there are a lot of other things. And the first button here is show material meeting. When you click that button, you end up with this page with the agenda. And if you go down a little bit, you will see all the material in order. And so now we'll be showing the hackathon. Dominique? Okay, thank you. Oh, remote. Okay. Good morning, everybody. So basically, uh, Alex uh, said it all. Uh, next time, please come and join. Okay. Do you want me to present the other slides? Um, so, why should you join next time? First, it's uh, big fun. Uh, all of the food is provided, 
morning, uh, midday, evening. You don't have to care about anything. Just two days focus time uh, working on the technology. I, I really love it. So if your family, your employer allows it, please do come and you will not regret it, I can promise. Um, the other thing is uh, we include everyone. So even if you think, hey, I don't have an implementation, uh, I don't know whatever micro Python or JavaScript or anything, do come anyway, because uh, we have little modes, uh, little boards like these ones. Uh, we have enough for everybody, especially if you let us know that you're coming and uh, we teach you how to use them. And you can, we have a uh, code in the repositories. You can just download the code, control the, um, the, the little board and run the code. And as we run the code, you get familiar with the implementation and with the draft. And then we can discuss details and find bugs in the draft. And if you do uh, know how to code um, Python, micro Python, then you can help improving the code in addition. But if it, even if you only come to play and run the code, that's good enough for us. So, um, I think that's it. Yeah, we wanted to disseminate awareness practice. That's what we did. We advanced the code a little bit. Uh, two uh, of the participants uh, are really good at coding. They advanced the code quite a lot. The others just, you know, discussed and played and tested, but it's it's okay and it's helpful. Uh, we had one remote participant, uh, Soichi, uh, in, in, from Japan, uh, who contributed and, and stayed there for the whole day, in, even though it was late, late at night in, in Japan. And so we got this uh, picture uh, in the group photo as well uh, over Skype. Um, yep. Um, we had, oh yeah, thank you for the, uh, companies that provided uh, LP1 connectivity, uh, Sigfox uh, provided connectivity, and Aclio provided uh, a LoRa network, so we could run real um, experiments on those networks. Uh, we have two code bases right now, uh, one for compression decompression, one for fragmentation reassembly, um, and one of, of our goals is to combine those together and have one code for the, the Chic draft. Um, yeah, um, I mean, you can read the slides for reference, but my takeaway message is next time come and have fun with us. It's really, really fun. Thank you very much, Dominique. And this will take us to the next presentation, which is the LP1 overview. So I'm going to take that. It works. This one. this one works now. Oh, I will from here. Yeah. I won't be on TV. Oh, okay. Go on TV. <laughs> okay. There's nothing much to say, but if you understand a bit. Okay. So Stephen had conflicts and he could not be with us to present the status of his document. There is nothing much to say. The progress through the ISG has been very good. And now the document is in the RFC editor queue. So we expect uh, the edit uh, as soon as, we, as they can to be submitted as informational. And we are very happy with the document. We got great comments and people really appreciated the reading. So we're very happy with it. Any question? Oh, that's it. Didn't you have a slide for thanks? So, Suresh, I see you nodding. Nothing else to say. <clears throat> so um, while Pascal is um, loading the next presentation, which is uh, Sheikh uh, uh, for IPUDP, I'd like to take the opportunity to also thank all the reviewers that uh, and all the contributors of LP1 overview document, which made an actually an excellent document, and I, I believe is the first uh, standard body document that goes out. That, that is published and that actually regroups information, useful information for the main um, LP1 technologies. So uh, great job and uh, I think everyone's super happy for this and it's a great contribution for, for the whole community. Thanks.
So the way we structure this presentation right now is more like a, a discussion. We have Dominique here with the shepherd and Anna who represents the authors of the document. And basically, since there were a number of problems uh, which were raised during the work group last call, uh, the mm -hmm. shepherd will present the problem and um, the architect will talk about the solutions, I guess. So let's try it. Okay, hello. Um, thank you very much to be here. Uh, I will present the history of this last version 10 from last IUTF. So we go, we start with version eight, where we start working in the fragmentation part in order to add terminology, to clean the text, and uh, to create the state machine um, fragmentations. Uh, we improve a lot of, uh, we, we work a lot in the fragmentation part in version eight. Then we, we create next, we continue working, cleaning up the fragmentation text and also the compression text a little bit less. We put the state machine diagrams in the appendix for version nine. And we start uh, making more integration of compression and fragmentation for this version nine. And we make the last call in December. We start in December. So thank you very much for all the reviewers. We received a lot of valuable inputs from you. We got a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and with all these inputs, we, we create the version 10 uh, on the end of February. What do you see? There are a lot of many editorial changes because our English is not so good. Uh, we reduce the abstract that it was very big. We create or we finish to complete the terminology section with a lot of terms, abort, ag, layer two, uh, chic packet, and so forth. Uh, we try to integrate more the fragmentation and the compression. Then we create three new sections. The first one is uh, chic overview, where we try to show where compression, where fragmentation is done. Well, then we create a role ID section. Uh, it's okay. We create a, <laughs> a global role ID section where we say uh, why or when we need uh, a role ID. And uh, we create a padding section to give the default solution for padding in the, in the case it will be needed. Uh, next, we also delete or eliminate the window word in the fragmentation modes of operation uh, to only keep three modes, no ACK, ACK always, and ACK on error. Uh, when we were cleaning the text, we find a lot of error in the fragmentation state machine uh, in ACK on error receiver, so we correct this. Uh, we update all the headers of, of IP UDP compress in chic section at the, at, the, at the last part. And also we update the chic example for fragmentation. Uh, so during this time, we create uh, and close and open tickets. These are the tickets that have been already done during the internet meetings. Uh, you will see the first one is rule ID. It comes again and again. I think it's a very good uh, subject to continue working in this group. Well, the first ticket number two, rule ID default size was the question to know this space, is what, how many bits it has, uh, how size it size, how is the pattern, how can I define it, and so forth. And well, we were discussing and we said that this document is more about to define compression and fragmentation. And perhaps we'll need a new document to talk about and define this rule ID space. And now it's out of the scope of the chic compression fragmentation document. Then we have a ticket number three, the zip bump, where we add in the security part that when a decompressor receives a, a lot of information to be decompressed, normally it's not normal, or something that is not normal, he must drop this information. 
in order to avoid an attack. And then we have num ticket number eight. Uh, the question was uh, if it was possible to use the same uh, D tag for different rules ID. The, the answer is yes, because this D tag defines the packet. So I can have different rules ID for the same packet. Then uh, we have ticket number nine, uh, reordering between radio gateway and network gateway. So there was a very big discussion in the last intern meeting about that also. Uh, where we define, we, we, we say that, we conclude that it's better to say that there is no, no out of sequence between radio gateway and network gateway and not reordering in order, yeah. So when you say there is no, we assume there is no, we don't we assume, yeah, make it, it a man mandate to the other technologies, yeah. but this works if, this works, uh, this document assumes that no out of seconds delivery happens below. Yeah, because uh, when we start working in the chic compression, we, we assume this part. So we don't want to make a real uh, sequence, uh, to have a out of sequence packets between the radio gateway and the network gateway. Okay. Uh, ticket number seven was the question was if we need default values for hop limit, for example. Uh, well, I think we don't need any default values for any header field because when we have a new value in a field of a header, we create a new rule. So a new rule gives you the new value. Um, ticket number six uh, can we? Can we do partially, can we partially fill the, the window in the fragmentation? Well, um, for all one windows on the last window, uh, most of them, or maybe most of them will be partially filled because it's the last window and perhaps it will not be uh, completely filled. For the all zero windows, uh, we, uh, if we give the, the best uh, behavior, we will fill the window completely in all zero windows. But it's not, uh, uh, we are not against to do not fill it. But if you use the partial filled window, it's only for act always mode. Uh, for ticket number four, the, the DNS lookup, Okay, uh, again, it's about rule ID, uh, how, uh, how to fill this rule, this context. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this is more or less out of scope because here we are talking about how we compress the header information and how we get the header information. So I think we need something to define all this part of rule ID how we create it, how we complete it, uh, which size it has, and so forth. This is our, these are the closed tickets. Uh, we have a last uh, ticket that is not closed, but it's not uh, relevant. Uh, we were asked to give uh, the technology-specific parameters that each technology will need to define in the document, in their document. So I opened the ticket number 15, where I put the list I have created for version 7. And we need to update this list in order to be uh, uh, according to the version 10 or the next version 11. Okay, so this was the, the tickets that have been closed uh, during the interim meeting. So. These topics have been discussed during the meetings. If, we're, if you were not part of the meeting and want to understand exactly what the details were of the discussion, you can come to us or read the, the minutes of the meetings. Um, we decided not to take too much time discussing closed tickets and spare time for the open tickets, which are going to come next. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, overall we have uh, 26 tickets in the queue right now. Uh, a few of them were closed, which we've just gone through. 
And so this is the tickets that we have in front of us. So we, um, we decided rather than take them by ticket number, uh, we would group them by topics and discuss the topics. And we've uh, uh, listed which uh, tickets the topics relate to. So don't bother reading this list. So basically, uh, one topic that comes again and again is uh, the overview. Uh, how does that work? There's compression, there's fragmentation, they seem to have things in common, like rule IDs, uh, but the comments we got, uh, I mean, we, the comments you got, <laughs> I'm not an author. Um, the, the comments that came up where we don't understand how these two things work together. Can you provide uh, an overview, an explanation? So I think this has been addressed. Um, I'll let you yeah. explain what you've done to address that. We addressed in the in the new section, in the first section of the draft, we, we create a section overview where we put this uh, figure in the left. Uh, here we explain where the chic layer is behind the layer tree. And the um, functional part is we, cre we make compression before fragmentation. Uh, then in the dry, uh, right part of the figure, uh, I explain more in detail the, the terminology of this uh, behavior. So when we receive uh, from layer three an IPv6 packet, it goes to the chic compression, the compression. <laughs> and here, the chic compression will try to compress it, even if it doesn't arrive to compress it because it doesn't have the correct rule, it will uh, add a rule ID specify for this kind of problem and will create a chic packet. So, a chic, yeah, so that, that's terminology. Uh, yes. We had a, the, One of the issues was that we had no specific name to uh, to name the, this thing that is behind compression and fragmentation. And so the text went about various fuzzy uh, naming, the either compressed or not compressed if it could not be compressed or blah, blah, blah. So now we term it a chic packet. So that's a new term that goes into the, term, the tech terminology. So the chic packet is a real compressed packet or a, a packet that cannot be compressed but has a real ID. Right. Okay. And then this chic packet, if if needed, if it doesn't fit in the layer two a PDU, it will be fragmented. And it goes to the chic fragmentation and it will be cut in chic fragments. So we create chic fragment, chic fragmentation, because before we were talking about fragmentation and fragments, and now we add the chic acronym before in order to join these two parts of a chic document. And by the way, I think we'll uh, capitalize the P in chic packet so, such that the term is recognizable in the text. So we try to be very specific with terms so we understand what it's been talked about. So and with a lot of input we get, uh, after we create version 10, uh, it was not very clear. Uh, right, I didn't like the if needed here, uh, because what does if needed mean? Who decides if it's needed or not? Uh, so right now, what the proposed uh, diagram that will likely be in the Dash 11 version looks like this. And so we're seeking inputs if, it's this, if this is clearer or if we need to do even more. So do you want to explain what happens here? And here, when, when I receive the IPv6 packet, here. Okay. 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 Well, you can read. Oh, yeah. When I receive an IPv6 packet, I go to compression. Whatever it happens here, I get a chic packet. If this chic packet fits in the layer two. I didn't make, I did not make fragmentation I, and I send it to the other side. If this chic packet doesn't fit, then I need chic fragmentation 
and I cut it in fragments and I send these fragments. When I don't, don't, didn't use this fragmentation in the other size, I only get decompression and I send the, the decompressed packet to the layer tree. When I make fragments here, then in the reassembly, chic reassemble part, I will get all the fragments, I will make all the chic mode, fragmentation modes, and then when I get the, the, all the packet, I send into the decompressor. So, I don't know if this figure is more clear than the one that is now in the version 10. Any comment from the room? Is that, does it make the document clear? I see if you nod. Okay, let's. So we have a thumbs up from uh, Julian. Let's have a, a show of hands. Who doesn't s think that this is a good thing? Juan Carlos, Uniga? Oh, Juan Carlos, please. See, sorry, just one quick comment. Does this assume any any? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, is there any assumption about the the rule space, the rule ID space? That we'll we come to that later. So okay. at this so, point, so this is nothing. independent, and we are not deciding on the space based on this at all. Not at this point. Okay. At Thank this you. point of the discussion, we are not uh, discussing the rule ID space, but we will be promised <laughs> in a few minutes. Okay. More comments. Uh, so, hopefully, this time, uh, people new to the draft will see, will see this drawing and say, okay, I understand what's going on and between compression and fragmentation. If this is still not the case, tell us and we'll try to do even better. But so, about, about the way to, to, to proceed here, we, there are quite a lot of open issues. So, um, uh, what I would say is, because I don't want to make everyone vote for like 10 times in the next 30 minutes, in case you feel that you, you you are not clear on this, or in case you feel that you are against something that is said here, please go to the mic or raise your hand, and this way we'll know to go on discussion. Otherwise, we say, okay, well, you consider that this is okay, and that the solution that is proposed here is okay for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, if I can just add, we have a lot of material to discuss, so if we can have a quick feedback, like, yeah, no, just a few nods, that's good for us. Otherwise, if the whole room stays silent and we go to the mailing list and it takes a month. Question from Soichi. Uh, if you receive a packet from the other, how can you know the packet is a fragment or compressed without fragment? Can you? It's the rule ID that gives you the, if it's a fragment or if it's a compressed packet. We'll come to that. We have a oh. few we slides have a on few it. few slides about that. So this it's the rule ID that gives you the difference between a fragment packet and a compressed packet. It will be discussed in details, glory details. Um, so, the, uh, still on a, on a topic that has raised many comments is terminology. Um, we don't understand, you know, how you, you name things. And so, as we, we said before, we've decided on chic packets, chic fragments, we will capitalize packet. And uh, we've decided on compressed header. Compressed header is um, what is achieved after compression of the packet coming from the upper layer. Uh, we are, shake is uh, header compression, the HC. So we're compressing the header. We're not compressing payloads, uh, which was not always understood. Uh, so we have a, now we, we, we are going to define a compressed header as being what results uh, what comes out of the compressor, and the compressed header is composed of two things. One thing is a rule ID, and the rest that we need to transmit uh, is called the compression residue. Hopefully, in the best case, uh, the rule is so well adjusted to the packet header that needs to be compressed that it's enough to send a rule ID, and it the rule ID tells everything about the compressed header. In some cases, there are a few bits that are not totally defined by the rule ID, and we, those bits will be sent, and this is what we call the compression, compression residue. So that's the compression layer. And then below it, we have the chic fragments, as Anna said. Um, and the fragments will send, the fragment payload will be parts of 
the shake packet, including the compressed header. And of course, we have fragment headers, uh, and they contain a few things that are described in a fragmentation section, such as a rule ID, D tag, etc. So hopefully, we, we came up with this drawing for this presentation, but we'll probably put it in the draft as well, in ASCII art. Good fun. Um, any feedback on that? Does it make things clearer? Not sufficient? If we put this in a draft, is everybody happy as far as they understand what is going on here? Juan Carlos Uh, uh my suggestion would be to, to simplify a little bit more even the, this. Like uh, if you just, instead of repeating the fragment, just define one fragment and then you put dotted arrows or something because otherwise it's a little too oh. busy. Okay, to, maybe to the understand. second one is not needed, but... Yeah, maybe the okay. one first, we... last or something. Okay, Thanks. thank you. That's good feedback. Um, so far, we had uh, ACK being described as a special case for a fragment. And I think it was kind of confusing because a fragment goes forward between the sender to the receiver. And, uh, and we have this ACK going backwards from the receiver to the sender. And so the way it was described so far was the, the ACK was a special numbering of a fragment, but then, you know, things get confusing. Uh, so we decided that we will coin a new term, which will be a chic ACK, so that we don't confuse it with the ACKs at other layers, um, and it will have its own name. It will no longer be described as a special case for a fragment. And so the encoding hasn't changed, but it will be called the Shikarik. One thing also I, I requested is that we didn't have a name for a line in the rule table. And again, the text went about, you know, different ways of naming that thing. And so we called it a field description in the table. So we can refer to it with its capitalized uh, name. So I think it will, again, make, make the text clearer. Okay, why is it terminology? Uh, I don't know. Okay, they were uh, probably the title. Dominic, uh, yeah. if you go back, please. It's George from uh, EMT Atlantic. Chic ACK is for chic packet or for chic fragment? For chic fragment. Okay, because I mean. Uh, we only use ACK for the fragment. Okay, fair enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, this is true. I think on this on this diagram, but I mean, your point is welcome. Maybe we missed something, but here we have a shake packet. Uh, if the packet doesn't need compression, there's no ACK um, because we don't care about that. That's not our issue. If the layer two wants to do ACK, if layer four wants to do ACK, that's their problem. Uh, but if we do fragment then it becomes an array of chic fragments, and there we have rely a few uh, uh, reliability mode, two modes that do involve acts. So they are chic acts. Do you think we should add chic acts on this diagram with a, an arrow going backwards? I see yeses. Okay, good point. We'll do that. Maybe it's only for me, again, George from EMT Atlantic. Uh, what about having a small condition just before the if no fragment, like saying that if fits to L2, then transmit. If not, go back to the uh, to the fragmentation. Yeah, uh, good point. We were discussing having this little diamond shape and... I think it will be more helpful and more clear, you know. But in ASCII art, it's hard. Okay, ASCII art. <laughs> what can we get it one? will be a good fun. No, soon. soon. Hi, Edgar Ramos from Ericsson. Um, we have had that discussion in the interim, uh, and the, the problem is that uh, depending on the technology, you might not even want to have fragmentation activated at all, um, because uh, you could have fragmentation in lower layers. So then, I mean, why you have fragmentation or not, maybe it would be good to be left out of the document and leave it in each technology document. So, yeah, to answer your point, actually, when we drew this, we, we had your case in mind, where this upper arrow saying transmission, if no fragmentation included, 
the case if the a given technology does not want shake to do fragmentation not just that the the packet fits into uh, the the actual frame so the if no was vague enough to include edgar's case now if we go your way adding the diamond shape then maybe we need to have another thing saying maybe you don't want to do fragmentation uh, so, Krishna. so edgar just to confirm you're saying like the the destiny need to be made after the input pipeline or like the technology can decide based on its mtu whether it wants fragments or not right so the input to this pipeline is an ipv6 packet so you could have decided before that right sure sure the problem is um this is edgar again um that uh, for example narrowband iot you could have um, basically no mtu uh, limit because you can segment in the lower in the lower layers so if there is any segmentation the optimization is done by the lower layer so you don't need to already add uh, headers on top of that so then it makes sense not to have fragmentation in in certain transmission mode so would would, would it be a fair uh, description if we say the packet fits into the l2 l2 pdu because basically the pdu is an unlimited size but you have another view of what the L2PDU is, I guess. Yeah, the problem is that, um, for example, for narrowband IoT, you have link adaptation, which it means that you the, the PDU size is not known until transmission, a couple of milliseconds before transmission. So then it would be pretty difficult to adjust this all the time. So what is the maximum size that you are going to have? So, it, so it, what, it would, what would be a good term to describe the fact that the packet does not need to be fragmented by shake because you can take care of it whatever its size is. But would, would be the right term. We we attempted to say L2 PDU, but we understand that L2 is, I mean, you are above L2, so, and we are below L3, so. Dominique, if you just say, if fragmentation needed, blank. I mean, and it's not this document. But needed was too vague. No, just for this document, it's okay, because there are specific documents after that. So. So uh, I, I'm happy with the if needed, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> chair, 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 chair had just a short question about the, uh, the the purpose of when this was asked, if I, my uh, memory is correct, was just for people to visualize how the process is happening. Uh -huh. So yes. I, I would like to, I mean, I, I would uh, um, keep this in mind and not put too many complexification in the picture because people, they say, okay, well, you know, there is this thing. I would like just to have like a big picture overview without going down to the nitty gritty details. So is it, I mean, there is maybe something for you to consider and for Edgar and for everyone, like, is it okay to leave it simple and have some star and, and then say, well, you know, if blah, 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 blah other ifs, but at least have the, the picture pretty simple. For, for people to grasp very rap very rapidly. Okay, first I do the compression, then you know if I need fragmentation, then I do the fragmentation, and then okay, if I need, then I need to define, and that's in a different document. So basically, we're discussing between this picture to the right, that picture on this slide, and an even more detailed version of that one with a diamond shape and explaining the decision. So that's the three options we're discussing right now. Well. What it means if needed fragmentation, that might be like maybe three lines in the text that it says if needed fragmentation is up to, you know, each of the documents, but majority of the case would be fit in a, if it fits an MTU. So it could be something like that, that it says kind of a default that it would be fit in the, the, the MTU, but then also clarifying that it could be uh, meaning something else in these other documents. Okay, that's one point. I hear that. Um, Suresh Krishnan again. So I, I like what he said, but I don't want it to be in line of this text. Like maybe you can say like a fragmentation is needed as per whatever and just point out somewhere else. Like because it kind of like completely messes with the flow of like people reading it if you have this big explanation. So I really like it. You say like a fragmentation is required as per appendix A1 and then you can probably put in like, oh, the link layer documents can uh, specify whether da da da, and then then be done with it. And I like this picture. I think it's this one here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's um, probably a midterm between the. It, it still shows the... there's like a decision point to be made there, but not explaining about like why or all those all the details about that. So that's that's good enough for me. Good point. Thank you. 
Juan Carlos Zuniga, yeah, well, I, I guess uh, just supporting the Suresh and, and Alex uh, points, uh, mm. I, I understand well Edgar's and perhaps uh, I would have other constraints for, with Sigfox. So, so if we just add it to the list of, of uh, to be done by layer two specific documents uh, and then we point to there, it'll be clear to say, okay, well, this is not known. I have to see what, what is on here and then, and then we get all the reference. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Okay, MSB, LSB. So the, the comments we got about that is uh, the text is a bit uh, unclear. What do you mean? What is X and Y? So just uh, to recap, uh, for those who haven't been following closely, um, we have a matching operator. So we have the pack incoming packet on the top. We match it against a pattern, which is a target value. Uh, the, the matching operator we're talking about at this point right now is the MSB of X operator, which means that we're testing if the field value that is presented to us uh, from the incoming packet has the, is, uh, has the top X bits equal to the target. If it does, then the rule applies, and if everything else matches in the rule, uh, we go to the compression action, CDA, and we do something. And actually, you don't have to have the CDA LSB uh, when you use the matching operator MSB, but it's what it's meant. I mean, they are meant to work together, so this is the normal situation. And in the document, we say we match with M X bits, and we can send Y bits. So uh, the people were confused about X and Y and you know what happens if X and Y are disjoint and there are missing bits in the middle and the draft currently didn't say that the target value has to be at least X bytes, X bits, otherwise you don't have data uh, to match the packet to. So and uh, what's the situation here? Can you explain us how this works and what the draft will say? Okay, when you have a um, MSB X bits uh, and you have a matching, oper a matching operator MSB, you will you will know the the length of the field, and you can you can compute the Y because you know the length, and you send the residue. In the chic packet. Oh, sorry. So you're saying if y is absent because this is y an is option. Yeah. This is allowed by the draft that the rule does not specify y. It's a simplification, and in this case, y will be the complement of x to the field size. Yeah. When when the length is known and the field and the field is fixed uh, has a fixed length. When the land of the field, the uh, header field is, is fixed, you know the length, then uh, you don't need to specify the length, then you can compute y with x and the length that you know. If y is not specified. Now, if y is specified, then you will send y bits as a residue. Yes. Because it's, that's what you want. And now, uh, if x and y do not add up to the field length, then what happens? Uh, go to the next slide. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm still on this one. <laughs> if X, X and Y don't add up, uh, well, if there are, if there are bits ah, in between. Okay. No, next one is a variable. So uh, if X and Y don't add up to the field size, uh, if there are, the total is smaller, then you there are a few bits that will not be matched against, so they are don't care bits actually, and uh, they will not be sent either, so they will be reconstructed from the other side, and so basically you're replacing don't care bits by uh, a priori bits on the other side, so you have to know what you're doing, because you, you are actually changing the packet, but this is allowed by the draft. Does anybody have a strong objection to that behavior? <coughs> um, Does everybody not understand what the, this is supposed to work? Pascal, did you find, uh, Pascal Cisco, do you have a particular case where you use it already? The, the hole in the middle? 
Because I, I was thinking about reserved fields, and when we have a reserved field, usually the rule is like, you, you must set it to zero and ignore it, you know, if you don't know what's in there. And so it looks like the, the default behavior of filling with zeros could be like a reserved field, but if you think about other use case than reserved, then maybe it's a different value. No, to tell this is, um, we are in a very strange case. No, I don't never see any case where you can apply this. And if you have reserved bits, so you know that they are in zero, so you can extend the x, x to reach the y. So for when you do the comparison. Well, so. you could say the bits are reserved, but in case I get some value that is non-zero in there, I will replace them with zero anyway. It, they are don't care on input and forced to zero on, out, on output. So that would be the behavior. So by, my, my question is, uh, we are specifying X and Y, and we are introducing this kind of weird situation. Do we need that? Or do we just simplify the, the draft and the mechanism by saying there's no Y at all, and Y is it automatically the complement of X to the field size? Um, okay. Um, uh, Alexander here. So what I would say here is that you could imagine that you could use in the LSB in other contexts, the, independently of MSB at some point. So uh, it's good to be able to specify LSB, like to say, okay, LSB takes a parameter and it takes the least significant bits. Um, then I would go with something like if it's necessary, either go Pascal's way, say, okay, well, others should be zero or, uh, or you know, maybe they can be taken from the target value or something. But um, I don't, I don't have strong opinion on this. So it could be really um, as the, the 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 room decides. Uh, I would feel that it's good to have it as it is, like the minimum changes to the draft. And if you feel that there must be some developed values, then you know set it to zero. Otherwise, if it's if it works for this, then it's okay for me. Okay, so I'm hearing that this is okay. We you're suggesting not to change anything. Does anybody in the room think that we this is really a headache and it's no use, so we should change it. Raise hands. Nobody. So yeah, just leave it this way. We'll try to, I mean, we came up with the drawings so that we are able to explain it to you. Uh, these drawings aren't in the draft right now. This is why I think people were confused. So we're, again, I suggest the authors put this drawing in the draft. So. Yeah, if I, would up, uh, I would like to have text in the draft that specifies that we put zeros, but otherwise it's fine for me. The, the, that specifies that we put uh, what zeros? What do we do with the value that could be there? I mean, if there are some bits that are not accounted for, whether we put zero or what do we do? I would like to have something like that in the draft, maybe. Well, no. you, well, the way it's written, uh, I think it's clear. The, the missing bits are filled from the target value. Now, the point is, if the target value is not big enough, it falls in between an X and Y, you may, have, you may be missing bits to fill uh, the, the other side with. But in the specification currently, we don't put the argument. We just put LSB, and it means that we compute the default value. Alex just said that we put zero in... Uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of y, but I think it's better to remove the argument in. Uh, oh, so you're saying LSB. don't put y anymore, yeah. and we only have the 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 LSB. behavior that's uh, explained that on the bottom line. No, just put LSB without any value yeah. after. So, so, so what? So so this behavior <laughs> happens, right? Yeah, and so we. Do not allow the, the X and Y uh, disjoint. No, fit. in the CDA, we just have uh, LSB and not LSB parentheses in something. Okay. No argument. Okay, so we always apply this. Yeah, so if, just, if, just if, if Y is not there, okay. just, if so absent equates yeah. to this. So you're saying we make it absent, so. Okay. Okay, just for timing, we are the half of the slot that we have here.
half of the time slot. Yes. Okay, interesting. Okay, if you thought this was complex, now we get to the real meat of it, because <laughs> <laughs> because this was all with fixed size fields, and now we have variable sized fields. So why do we have variable size fields? Uh, we, in, I mean, the, the group wants to compress co-op. Co-op has URIs. URIs are variable in length. Contrary to IPv6, UDP, which have fields that have well-known sized, you know, it in advance, it's, if it's going to be a PV6, you'll find so many bits for this, for that, for that. Now we have co-op, which has the options with the URI options. And those are strings that can be of any size. So now we need to do matching on variable size fields and compression of those fields as much as we can or want. Um, right now, the only case we have for variable length field is co-op URIs. So it, it was kind in the mind of the authors that this was the only use case. And I mean, the explanation was kind of uh, driven by that assumption, which may not have been present in the reader's head. So we're trying to explain what's going on here and then we'll decide what we put in a draft. So, let's take the case of the URI needs to be transmitted. Uh, it's random and we can't elide it any, in any way because we don't know what's going to come. So then we would use a matching operator which is ignored. So we just ignore this field value and we use a CDA which is send it. So we will send as a residue this uh, field value. Now, because it's variable length, we have to tell the decompressor uh, what the size of this residue is, because it can't tell from the rule. So it needs to pass this shake packet that's coming in, and it needs to know how many bits are in this residue, which is a field value. Uh, so the draft says we send a field length so that the decompressor knows how many bits is a residue. Uh, because it was meant for co-op URIs, and URIs are strings which are 8-bit bytes, the draft currently says the length is expressed in bytes. So everything else is bits. Uh, Schick says no alignment whatsoever. Everything is bits, except here, which is we treat data byte data, byte aligned data. And so the length is a number of bytes. And this got people confused. Why is it bytes? You said it's only bits. So this is why. Um, of course, the authors could make it bits, but in most use cases, you wouldn't have three, bit, three extra bits to number bits, with, and the number would always be a multiple of eight anyway. Um, before I, I uh, let you interject, Laurent, I just want to explain one more thing. The length is sent before the residue, and the author decided the length can be extremely variable. You can have small fields, small URIs, like one character or three characters, and you can have long ones, like dozens of bytes in your string. And so, what size should be the length that is sent on, uh, over the wire? Uh, should it be 3 bits, 5 bits, 6 bits, 8 bits? If, it, if you make it too big, then you're wasting bits. If you make it too small, then you cannot encode longer values. And so, the smart idea was that the length will be variable length encoded like Cibor, for those who know Cibor. So if the length is a small number, it will take few bits on the wire. If the length is a large number, it will take more bits. And so the draft explains this encoding, which is not the same as Cibor. And so now the draft talks about the length and also talks about the length of the length. And that got people confused, and I can understand that. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, uh, and I say, and if the field was a length field, like IPv6 length, then you could also be talking about the length, the length of the length, length of the length. <laughs> but luckily, this doesn't happen because the length field is a fixed length field. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I got your attention. Um, so yes, we now we understand the draft is a bit <laughs> difficult to read. <laughs> um, Now, there is another <laughs> situation. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just, I said... Just, just a question here. So, uh, what is the solution here? So, the problem we understand... Okay, is... and we're just explaining what happens. Mm -hmm. And again, if you strongly object and say, uh, no, we want uh, length uh, in bits, not bytes, because I have a use for a variable length field that is not bytes, uh, tell us, or no, I want bits because uh, on a philosophical ground, I want everything to be bits, tell us, otherwise things are going to stay the, sa the way they are. The thing I'm doing here is explaining what the f how it is right now in the draft if you have attempted to read it and not <laughs> succeeded. I just want to add that normally when you define the rule, you have a length field at the beginning that tells you the length of your field, of course, and it can be a number, so it's a fixed length, or you put a keyword. Currently, we defined var to say that it's a variable length. And it's not in the text now, we have to add it, but we have to say that the unit is a bytes. But we can also create another keyword that could be the length in bits. So, and then we can apply the same process. So, it's not a radical change in... Uh, Right, Thank you're you. saying if we change mine later or some, we discover a use for variable length fields that are not byte aligned, we can always introduce it later with, without disrupting, <laughs> without breaking anything. Yeah. Uh, so, so, why is it different from CBOR? Why should it have to be? It's different from CBOR because in CBOR you have small values. And then you say it's a byte, it's two bytes, it's four bytes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here, in fact, what we want to do is to be to the closest on the smallest value. And so we don't want to waste the smallest value to say it's one byte or two bytes. So we go to the end, and then we extend to one more byte. So we want to to have only small value because it's stupid to send long URI when we want to send an LP1. So normally people will focus on small values. Okay, so uh, I've uh, described the ignore and value send, uh, which is we get a URI, we have no idea what it's going to be, we didn't want to burn uh, dozens of rules to match anything, so we just ignore the, this field in the matching operator and send it. Another case which is very similar, so it doesn't need more discussion, is the MSB LSB uh, pair, MO and CDA. So we match the first characters of the URI and send the rest. That's easy. Uh, now we get to another one, which is uh, you are expecting a few possible URIs, like foo, bar, or index. Foo is three characters, bar is three characters, index is five characters. And that's the only three URIs you are expecting. Anything else you don't need to process, you can drop the packet or we don't want to optimize that. So we have, you have a variable length field, which is a URI coming in, and you're expecting three values, three potential values. So you, the, the basic mechanism in Shake is to use match mapping and mapping sense. So you look at the incoming packet, see if the field value is among a list, the target value being a list in, this, in the match mapping operator. And if, if it is among the lists, then instead of sending that field value, you send the index into the table. The table is known at the receiver. So from the index, the receiver will be able to reconstruct the field value. So the residue in this case is going to be the index into the table, not the value. And the index has a static length. It's known from the other side. So we don't have to send the length because the index is a fixed length. So again, this was a confusion in the draft that we talk about the incoming length, uh, incoming field that has variable length, but then we don't send the length on the wire, even though the incoming packet, incoming field is of variable length. And this is because the index is 
of static size, uh, known size. Uh, Dominique, yeah. in, in some of those, uh, well, some of the pieces of the strings that you're carrying there may be case sensitive and some of them may not. And so do, do you have a matching on case sensitive field versus non case sensitive field? I don't think you do, that's why I'm asking you. Okay, I heard you said For, the case you have a neural, the... right? And there is a DNS piece, and there is like a uh, the, the rest of the path, and, and maybe the DNS piece is not, not case sensitive, right? And so you don't want to have a matching operator for every possible variation of cases. It's a huge and... combinatorial. So what what do the authors well, <laughs> reply the, the, to well, that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Currently, we are case sensitive. Currently, we are case sensitive. Case so Currently, you them? have to put both in the list. For example, if it's you are not, using matching, it's match not mapping. both. It's two to the power n. Yes, it's a lot. n characters. So it, the, the, basically, the idea would be to have a match, which is which is a character yes. match, uh, which is case insensitive, and you do do, do a bit match if you're case sensitive as you do today. So that would be a different matching operator, which which would look <coughs> to to have a case independent thing. Not only. Not only matching operator; it's also, it's uh, equal that has to be modified too. Yeah. Well, well, mm. you you find the best way, but okay. I think we should take the point. And okay, so this is about variable length field. Uh, any comment from the room? Those of you who have been following that. Any recommendation to the authors? So, so a, a question here. Uh, so here you're presenting that there was um, ambiguity in the text. You applied some modification to the text, and now you consider that it is more readable, right? If if I understand correct. Um, I'm saying I don't think there were that many people who really could understand what's going on with the mm -hmm. text. We spent about six hours in the next in the mm -hmm. previous two days to make sure we, everybody around the table agreed on mm -hmm. what actually was going on. Okay. And we tried to capture that in the drawing. And now I'm expressing this over to you. And I'm asking if everybody, everybody is happy with that behavior. If I get a yes, then the authors will try to capture that understanding into a document that is legible. Uh, so there's question. So I think the text in the draft is wrong. It doesn't capture a condition properly, okay? So the condition is length 255. Um, so if you have 255... There's a mistake on yeah. 255. Okay, that's, okay, that's, that's cool. Okay. So as long, I think if you just like drop it to 254 and yeah, then the other ones, it. then we should be okay. Yeah, this is cool. captured already. Thank you. Question from Soichi. So the size of the index must be defined in the rule table. Is that correct? So the size of the index in case of... Uh, Yes, the so rule define. table is a target value that is a list. And the number of elements in the list tells you how many bits you need to encode the index. So this is implicit in the, in the field description. You can make it explicit if it's a list. Okay. Um, so again, if you have strong Objections to that, raise it now or on the mailing list in the next few days. Otherwise, this is what we are going to try to write in the document. Okay, rule ID. Haha, <laughs> now we come to the real debate. <laughs> so, yeah, we got these comments over and over again. The draft doesn't specify the size of the rule ID. Uh, so, I'm going to reveal some breaking news to you. Actually, the draft doesn't even mention any numbering system. People have been assuming, including myself, up to two days ago, I was assuming that there was a fixed size rule ID. Not, not that the size was defined by the draft, but that the draft assumed that the size would be fixed and the number of bits would be defined elsewhere. But actually, they opened my eyes by telling me, well, it doesn't have to be a fixed number anyway. So, that, what does the draft say? <laughs> so, what, what, what is actually the purpose of the rule ID? Anna, can you tell us what, well, why we need rule IDs at all? The, the rule ID will, is needed to identify the, the compression rule 
all the context for compression. It's needed for uh, identify the specific mode of fragmentation and the settings of fragmentation. Uh, and it's at least we need perhaps one rule or more than one for the case where compression is not possible and fragmentation is not needed. And then we have an IPv6 packet and we need to have a rule ID for this specific case. Okay, uh, so yeah, maybe I jump, to, jump back to this one. So actually the rule IDs are just there to tell things about. When you are the receiver of there, how do you know what you're getting on your you know, layer two payload? So it could be either a compressed packet so you have a rule ID and the rule ID tells it's a compressed packet, a uh, chic packet, and uh, this is a rule to be applied to decompress. Or it could be a chic fragment. You have to be able to tell it's a fragment. And if there are multiple modes, window modes, uh, um, I I always reliability I modes, uh, Each sorry, mode has and, a rule ID and different. window size, yeah. you have to be able to tell them apart. That's why we have rule IDs, so to be able to identify what we get on the receiver side. But there's no, absolutely no assumption on how do you tell them apart. As long as you can tell them, tell them apart, you're fine. And so you could use any numbering system. You can use entropic coding, variable length, open, uh, open numbering to the right, could be anything. So the draft does not assume you've allocated a fixed number of bits. It doesn't tell you how many bits, but it doesn't even tell you that there's a fixed number of bits. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, Edgar Ramos again. Um, I think it's important what you're saying that uh, it's not specified as a fixed number, because otherwise, if you have um, a packet that is not compressed, and you need to attach to that a rule ID, so actually, instead of compressing, <laughs> yes. we are adding more overhead. Yep. So then something clever has to be done, maybe technology-wise, to indicate that, that that rule ID is actually meaning that there is no compression, and then try to reduce the overhead as the, to the minimum. But rule ID could be zero. Could be... Could be one bit. You need at least bit. one bit. Sure, but then, yeah, if exactly. You, 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 you add one is, bit. But many times, by adding one bit, then uh, actually you're adding a byte, because, you know, the... the, the because the, the octet alignment and so on. But I mean, it was just an observation. I, I'm not really right. uh, fighting against this. Just that to keep in mind that then that that's a consequence of this. Right. And it's good to keep it in some way um, free so that it can be found a clever solution. Mm. Yeah. So it's a recommended recommendation you're making to the technology specific documents because exactly. this only tells, and we are, I'm here to try to have a draft that expresses these things clearly, uh, we're going to have a, a draft that says you need to tell things apart. That's it. How you do it, not yeah. this draft. So, so I'm supporting what what basically you're saying. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. And and what got people confused is that in the draft we have these figures nine to twenty three, which is uh, uh, fourteen figures that. I found confusing because it, they had this R value, which was the size of this uh, fragment header, and T is a constant, N is a constant, it's explained in the draft. So, so I was kind of assuming that R was a constant as well, but it doesn't have to be. Well, everything, in the, this is a fragmentation header, and anything is fixed at, uh, but W. That is one bit, because rule ID has not a fixed size, D tag has not a fixed size, and FCN has not a fixed size. So it depends what you are choosing to do, that you have this R larger or smaller. So um, when you look at this, of course, as I said, you said, uh, we we can get confused. To know if R is always the same size all the time or not. So um, uh, perhaps we can. What do you think of removing this R and put it uh, fragmentation header so instead? The, or yeah, the current uh, recommendation within the group of authors is to remove R because it's confusing and not 
you know, uh, eliminate any risk of confusion that is a fixed size. Um, so that's a proposal. And do you think anyf of anything better the authors could do? Hearing none, so. Okay, cool. Yeah. Juan Carlos Uniga. I, I'm not sure you're hearing on it's just we're trying to digest what you are explaining but at least that's my case so uh, what you're saying is that the the values will I mean I understand that they can there can be different sizes of FCN and the rule ID itself but what you're saying is that they will vary in time uh, over the same technology and the same connection or no it, it will not vary from the same packet but it will vary from different no. packets why From like if or what what is the advantage of that it will vary from one rule id to another so you can have a rule id with a fcn of uh, three bit and another rule id with fcn of four bits for example here um, is we are in fragmentation and uh, for compression we can vary from rule id from rule id and different packets has a different rule id with a different size but here in fragmentation, all the packet that is fragmented will have the same rule ID, DTAC, FCN size. All the fragments of this packet that will be fixed in a certain way. It, your question was, does it vary over time? If you're processing the same thing, it does not vary over time. But you can have multiple fragmentation modes, window sizes, and, and so you would have different N values if you're using one or the other. But uh, for, for one rule ID, R will be the same, for the same rule ID. Is that what you're saying? For the same rule ID, you can have uh, the same D tag and the same FCN. So you may choose to have a different size if you have different rule IDs, or you may not. You may decide to have the same and simplify things a lot. Well, it's a general, for example, if I have, have rule ID 1 with DICTAC 3 and FCN 2, I can have rule ID 2 with DICTAC 4 and FCN 5, uh, and then, uh, well... Uh, no, the confusion in, in the document that you think that for any things, everything will be R bits. And it's not the R is something that varies from one world to another. It's not constant of other worlds. That may vary. May. Yes. Okay. May. I mean, the draft doesn't prevent it from okay. happening. And we don't want to convey the impression that this is the case. This is Diego from Universidad Diego Portales. Um, the question is, uh, is the, this should be the, defined, the, the, the size of the rule ID and the, uh, and the, the numbering of rule IDs within the, the specific technology itself, or they will be from the implementer? It could be both. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, technology will give you the, um, I don't know, the, the behavior, more or less, what you have to do. They will not tell you exactly how you have to implement it. But okay. in the want, implementations can do. Yeah, when, one example could be on LoRa. For example, there's this, this specific byte that's called the F-port. It's there anyway. It's mm. not costing anything. It has some reserved value, but as long as you use the unreserved value, it's free. So mm -hmm. you could map rule IDs onto the free values of F-Port because it, you know, it doesn't cost more. Uh, on some other technologies which don't have this kind of F-Port byte that's special, mm -hmm. you're eating into your payload, and mm -hmm. so you want, you want to be very thrifty in the number of bits you allocate, or you can do entropic coding or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you're doing an interoperable system, you'd better have the two ends agree on the, this okay. thing. If you're doing a private network, then you can divine, def, design your own. Okay, thank you. Actually, I know from Kelling. Uh, my question is maybe dumb, but uh, how do you get the rule ID size when you have a variable rule ID? So if I make a parser, how do I find out where to stop to get the rule ID length? Well, if it's uh, entropic coding or variable length encoding, then you have to look into it to know what its size is. That's, uh, you okay, know. So it's described inside the rule ID itself. I mean, if if an A technology in, in unimplemented decides to make it 
a fixed number of bits, then you don't have to look at the value to know the size. If it decided to make it otherwise, you may have to look into the value to know the size. That's just regular <laughs> coding. If I look better off here. So yeah, for me, it's uh, from the context, you could know what are the possible row IDs, and then you might, uh, of course, try to see which one match, and it's up to the creator of the context to be sure that uh, you cannot match two at the same time. Right, what this draft says is that you need to be able to tell things apart. So if you use a bad <laughs> numbering, you create ambiguity. That's all this draft should say. All the rest is left to technology or implementation. Thanks, Juan Carlos. So I originally had the same concerns as Julien. That's that's why I was asking you. You know, if it's May. So uh, at least personally, I would say just clarifying this document. You know that it's it's a May. You have that flexibility that may be useful for some people and for some other people may not be useful at all. So it's just uh, clarifying that it's not one or the other that we are. Yeah, my recommendation to the authors is to to be explicit as to why we need rule IDs, what they are used for, what the, their single purpose is, which is to tell things apart, and leave all the rest to the other documents. And maybe we can have an appendix that suggests things like a fixed number of bits or anything. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, so. I don't understand what the issue is. The draft currently says this is technology specific, R is technology specific, and it's defined elsewhere. So what are we trying to fix here? No, we're just trying to explain that R may not even be a constant. For a technology? Yes. Okay, then I have the same question as uh, Julian and, and uh, Juan Carlos, right? Because either we say, like, just leave it to the technology and let the technology figure it out, and they explain whatever, right? Just yeah. say like R is whatever the technology says and handle it in the technology specific document yes. whether it's fixed or not because somebody might want to keep it fixed or not. So let's not even go there. The current text is good. I don't want to change anything. The thing is, pers that's my personal opinion. I don't like R being there at all because it kind of conveys the idea that it's a fixed size. And I, I personally, I would... There's no, no text in there which says it's fixed or constant or anything like that at all. Right, right, but it's just... And it constantly repeats that it's not a multiple of 8 bits. That's all it keeps saying, but yeah, I got that, right? But other than that, I, I, I see no indication that it's fixed at all. There is no indication. Yeah, yeah uh, well, okay, so maybe... No, but, but, but that's my personal opinion, right? No AD hat or anything, but like I, I don't see a change to fix, but if you start taking this out, then provide some indication to the like link technology people like what they need to do to specify this. Otherwise, just leave it as is. Right, that, that was ticket 15 that we need to specify what technologies uh, must specify. Um, so this is taken care of. The, 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 the one thing I'm personally opposed is having this R character in the diagram because it conveys wrong ideas. But that's the only change I, I am suggesting. That, that's not the time. That's just the screensaver. <laughs> time out. <laughs> okay, just uh, Carlos Gomez. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, anyway, is that the rule ID for header compression and the rule ID is used for fragmentation share the same rule ID space. So that's something we also need to keep in mind in all this process. Right. So yeah, this can be another discussion. But right now, it, they share the same space. And that's why I'm saying you need, to, you need to be able to tell things apart. And what you just said is that they share the same space is actually a consequence of what I said. You need to be able to tell things apart. Because you can be getting a chic packet and fragment it, or you could be getting fragments. And you need to be able to tell things apart. So you have an, a rule ID. And they belong to the same space because you could be getting one or the other. That's it. And okay. Uh, Dominique, you're already out of time, but since your chairs are so generous, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're giving you 10 more minutes. Oh, thank since, you. Since you deserve it so much. Okay. One more, one more topic padding. We got lots of comments about padding. Uh, so, uh, 
We have yeah. also we have also discussed a little bit in the interim meetings. Right, right. And uh, when we decide was to not make it mandatory, uh, it depends on the layer two technologies. So what we specify today in the version ten was uh, default padding that may be used if it's needed for these technologies, or they can use anything else. Okay, so maybe uh, let's speak openly. Uh, there is one technology out there which is Sigfox that has a forward payload that's not byte aligned. We know one, it's Sigfox. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, I mean, it's part of our target. So, uh, they can transport any payload uh, of any number of bits, not bytes. Yeah. So, we don't want to constrain any alignment in the sheet document because, you know, why waste bits? Every padding is a new bit that's being sent on a wire. So, what this document says and aims at doing is not being aligned on anything, only bits, of course. Um, so that's the intention. And actually, I personally think that the document uh, could be better because it does talk about byte boundaries here and there in the in the document. So I'm, I'm advocating for it to talk about natural boundaries for the underlying technology which might be bits in some cases so juan carlos uh, sigfox just cl clarifying because uh, uh we thought we had a small but uh, perhaps a little confusing text that i just recently updated uh so clarifying on, on the way it works uh in sigfox you can send either one bit or bytes Oh, so okay. so I, I I try to add some some text, okay. and that's in the uplink. On the downlink, it's an eight byte that's fixed constant. Uh, fixed. So that's it's we have to treat it differently. Okay. But uh, coming back to your point, uh, we in, in the uplink we may need to pad up to one byte. Okay, so uh, it's not any bit alignment going uplink. It's only one bit or a number right. of bytes. So okay, right. so it makes it simpler. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And anyway, Dominique, maybe also when you talked about the co-op and things which is counted in bytes, do you imagine that people would shift that? It seems that at least the, the variable byte aligned, the, well, strings of variable lengths, they should all be byte aligned, right? No. I don't no. see you shifting those things, would you? Yes. Computation is free uh, compared to transmission. I mean, the ratio 1 to 100. Uh, so yes, you will do Which shifting, uh, uh, you know, for free. Uh, sorry, Krishna. So not like related to any specific thing, but uh, I found the issue tracking to be a bit difficult because when you said for the last one, it's an issue number twelve, right? I think it would have been useful if you had a real issue tracker, and I, I offered to set up one with um, because it's like everything is just on the mailing list, and it's hard for me to keep track. I don't know if you have another system somewhere. That they're keeping track of, but I only see yeah, like this, uh, well, I create the ticket uh, yeah. on the mailing list, right? Or is no, there no, any no, other no, no, ticket tracker? The, but tracker. they never send it automatically to okay. the mailing list. Okay. So I send it manually in order that everybody okay. can read it. But okay, we'll uh, okay. So provide just like I, I didn't see the link between the arbit issue here and and like that is going to be fixed using issue twelve somewhere. So. Oh, you mean this says 12, and what does it have to do with 12? Is that your question? No, for the R bit, you said it's like we're going to address it in 12, right? Or no? Yes, I said uh, 15. I said this is one ticket which was this draft should have a list of parameters that the other documents should remember to specify. The things that we are deliberately leaving open. That need to be. Uh, it needs to be updated because today is in version seven. That, that's fine, but I, oh. I cannot see like you know when you talk about the arbit saying like it's addressed by like fifteen or or whatever number. It's like I don't see that linkage anywhere. You don't see it where? Okay, go go to the arbit. Right. So we're saying this document does not specify R. Okay. But there should be a section like an appendix. Okay. which says technology specific documents please remember to specify the value for r or the mechanism that you use to number rule ids okay so you're going to on the change log for the next rev you're going to say this is going to push it to 15. So there's going to be a section containing the list of things that this draft 
leaves open for technology. But for 15, development. you're going to say it's pointing to issue number. This is resolved by the solution to 15. Is right. that my, my question? So I, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, padding. So, Anna, tell us how so, much. Um, just one thing. If you have like one point that you would like to to solve the, here, okay, that last be a good minute. Point. No, I mean, you maybe have five minutes, but uh, just pick the one that you would like to address. Pick the, the issues. One. Okay. Uh, well, this one. This one is shocking because it is no, making a lot of confusion. No, you don't like it. <laughs> can I give it? We are almost finishing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hear the room doesn't send anything, so everyone is okay with this. No. no. <laughs> well, we, we can always address them on the mailing list, but which one would be the most... I'm, I'm trying For to pick someone that's most me. difficult to explain on the mailing list. Oh. Uh, yeah, this one is a nice one. Okay, let's. <laughs> okay, guys, this is your desktop. Uh, can you put the next one? And no, no. defer. Yeah. yeah, this one. Uh, so. Okay, let me let, let me explain what the thing is, <laughs> and now uh, you explain the solutions. Uh, yeah, we have two ACK formats. There's ACK for Windows that are not the last one of a packet. And there is the ACK for the last window of the packet. And for the last window, we have a C bit, which tells if the MIC checked OK or not, because we think we've reassembled the whole packet. And so we verify that assumption by computing the MIC and comparing it to the one that was sent. And if this matches, we send back a C bit with a value of one. If it doesn't, we send back a value with C of zero. So this is a way we know the transfer of all fragments were, is, is completed OK. And so we have the fragment format has one more bit for the last window. So we're sending windows of fragments getting X for each window, and the last window gets an ACK. And this ACK has a slightly different format than the previous ACKs for the same flow of fragments coming from the same packet. And this fragment is, this ACK coming back has one more bit. Is it a problem or not? So, yeah, it may be a problem. <laughs> when is it a problem? <laughs> I don't see the problem, but okay. <laughs> well, we have, we add this C bit. And what this do is that the window in the last, uh, the window of the last, uh, the last window is shorter than the other window. Yeah. There are cases where this is no problem. If your if your <laughs> L2 is has a payload big enough to accommodate for all bits, you don't care. You have one more bit, so what? Okay, just send this one more bit. Now we are discussing the situation where. Yes. Your L2 payload is kind of small, and you're trying to optimize its use. And so we're discussing, you know, fitting acts into the L2 payload. And now we have this last act that's one bit bigger. And this one bit bigger might be a problem if you're trying to fit a short payload. So we are discussing the case where this one extra bit is a problem. What should we do? So there are two options. There are two options. The first is we, we make only a warning as it is today, saying that the last window is uh, having one bit less than is shorter. And then the implementer the implementers has to adapt this bitmap to this sh smaller window. But the last, the last smaller window. So let me uh, rephrase that. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, of... because we don't have time. And the second option is. I'm the shepherd. No, Come but on. we don't have time. And You're the, the second sheep. option is uh, we specify the last window uses, and then we reduce in all the uh, fragments, all in all the windows, one fragment. So in all zero windows, we lost one fragment, and we have the, the last window complete. 
Okay, so option one. <laughs> we don't change the mechanics that's in place right now. We just add a warning note in the text to implementers or technologists or whatever and say, pay attention to this extra bit. It might bite you. Uh, no, bite <laughs> is not the right term. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it might hit you. <laughs> pay, just pay attention. If you're short on, on your L2 payload, make sure your max window FCN is a bit smaller than you would think because you have to accommodate this extra bit on the last act. So you will not, why does it have a link with max window FCN? Because the bitmap that you're sending back on an act has a number of bits that's equal to the max window FCN. So if this bit is a problem for you, make sure you don't fill up the other uh, acts leave space for this extra bit. Another option would be to change the mechanics that's currently described by this draft, saying the last window is an exception to the fragmentation mechanism. The last window will not send max wind FCN fragments at most. It will send at most max wind FCN minus one. And we know and the both ends know that, so we create that extra space for this one extra bit. When so we're changing the mechanics. Yeah, but when you create this extra space, you are losing one bit in the known in the all zero windows. No, no, that was option one. What you just said applies to option one. Now option two. For the all zero windows, we still have the same number of fragments. So we're utilizing the full bandwidth both ways. And we create an, an exceptional processing, which is the last window has a different processing. It has a different bitmap size. So we create a space for the C bit. Does anybody have an opinion on that? <laughs> Carlos Gomez. So uh, did anyone ask or object to the way how it is currently in the document? Well, we got comments. Can you explain? We, we have a sentence in the draft that says something about this extra bit and something that people should be paying attention. So we got the comments. What do you mean? What, what exactly should we be paying attention to? And so I'm trying to explain you what we should be paying attention to. And then during the discussion, once option two emerged that we could change the behavior of the machine such that people don't have to pay attention. So, because, uh, well, maybe being an author, uh, I'm uh, influenced or whatever, but uh, I, I think what currently the text explains should suffice. I mean, uh, I don't know if... Uh, so you're advocating has... for option one and maybe we can make the sentence better so that people don't maybe, inquire. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe. Any other opinion? I think no. Uh, I think that uh, the, the option two is maybe too restrictive because it will not happen uh, often. Because if you you have a bitmap uh, FCN of three bits, then you have a bitmap of uh, five or uh, it's uh, eight bits. So it's not that big. So it fits in most of uh, the answer. So it's very. It will be a very very rare case. And in this case, maybe it's better not to, to use over the uh, no hack or something. So I don't think it's a problem. I think it, we should document it, but we must document it. But okay. Not, uh, so yeah. So you second option one, and what I heard you saying also is reminding people that we are discussing this special case where you're very constrained on your L2 payload size on the return path, and so that is extra bit does matter and so you're saying in most situations most technologies this extra bit does not matter and we're discussing something that nobody cares about okay. so um, rather than changing the mechanics you're suggesting changing a sentence an explanation sentence in a draft so i think this is pretty okay. clear so, uh, a short question about uh, that can this be solved also in ticket 15 to say to technology uh, so the, doc the information that is requested by technology specific documents to say well please take a look at this and put a sentence in your technology-specific draft. What do you do in this case? 
Okay, so if the working group decides we go option one, then you're right. Uh, we can add this into ticket 15 to be explicit, mm. have an explicit warning to the other draft. Mm. If the uh, working group decided to go option two, then we would need to change the state machines and everything. But what I'm hearing right now is option one. But Dominique, he, he, I mean, did he, if you want to leave an option to, to the specific documents, then you need to provide both options so to let them no. choose. And, and you don't want to do that, so you have to pick one. Right, I mean, right. You can't, you can't leave, what, what can you tell the, the, the other document? They can do anything, there is no option left for them, unless you provide the two of them. And nobody seems to no, encourage no, no, you to what do What Alex that. said is that if we go option one, we have this warning. Uh, warning to be written, and so it could be added to the list of things that the technology... But there is no to-do associated, right? It's just a warning for the writer. Just but write a warning. The, but they can't act on it. No, no, no. no. It's... Well... They, they can't make a, a tuning decision on their stuff, right? They can just limit what they, they do, but... Okay, so you say it doesn't belong to get 15 because... Uh, well, no, it does not. I think okay. it's, it's, we're all set. That's what I would think. Okay, I think we agree on what needs to do. It's to write a warning. Oh, okay, so one, maybe if you have one last word on this one, I'm on one last slide okay. before we move on to the next. Uh, uh, okay, so we'll go to the mailing list with all the other issues. We'll sum up, sum up the discussion we have. The good news is I've probably given you the impression that things are fuzzy, but the good news is the protocol is stable. Actually, we are, we are discussing ex explanations of what is going on and not discussing what is going on in most cases. And so we, we, ha we are not changing the mechanics. And this is a feedback I get from this session as well. So this is good news. And so my role is to try to have a text that is as clear as possible as to what's going on within Chic. So we're going to address all the issues, uh, propose new text in version 11. So we kind of figured that would be in three weeks from now. Uh, and and we'll go for another round. So if you have more comments, <laughs> if 11 is not good enough, we'll rev it up again. And if, okay. Yep. Thank you. No Thank more you. questions. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, uh, Julien? And what is the, Laurent, what is the process after the publication of draft 11? We do a last call again, or it's, no? There was nothing much which justifies having to do a last call. We are fixing the last call problems, but we never opened a, a big door. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so, this question. so I, I don't necessarily need another last call, but if you just say like new version is posted, just look at the new text and just like limit your like short, let's say like one week last call to do just the new text, that would be okay with me as well in case you want to do it. Because people who don't like this fix, who are probably not in this meeting and right, like they can see it because, so like this is what I was saying before for the issue tracker, like th there's no change log in the document and there's no versioning in the issue tracker. So there's no way, like I cannot go and look at this thing and say this was fixed by version 11. It's not there, like I'm, I'm oh, because I did the query and there was nothing turned up, right? Like so we need to, make sure that like the link is made one way or another, either in the tracker where you say it's fixed in this version or in, in the draft itself, the change log saying I fix issue 15. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Actually, the slides have some information like that, so I will ask the authors to reflect what you have in the slides, like this was fixed by version blah in the tickets. That, that's fine. Like I'm just saying like for people who are not in the meeting to follow this, right, because the last call will be on the list. And like if somebody is not here, who's not following this, like they need to somehow correlate these two things. And as long as you do that, I, I don't need a full last call for this. And so with this, we invite Julien. Thank you, Julien. Um, do you have the... Yeah, okay, so let's fly. So I would ask you to be quicker. You have 10 minutes, but if you yeah, can... I'll try. So I'm Julien Catalano from Kelnik. I will present the Chico Valora one uh, draft. So I'm one of the other with uh, several people. So that's the first uh, slide. The status of the draft is that we set up a task force uh, with the help of our chairs we, who invited uh, some people from the LoRa Alliance last time. So he, they did a good job. So thank you. Uh, the task force is led by Semtech, who, as you know, might, might know that they are the inventor of the LoRa and the leaders of the technical committee of the LoRa Alliance protocol. 
So the company involved in, in, this, uh, in this work are Semtec, Acrio here, with the value also, Actility with Alper Yigin, who is not here today, uh, Curling with myself and Vincent with uh, EDF R&D. So we are quite a good group uh, of people knowledgeable about uh, LoRaWAN, so that's, that's good news. So first of all, I want you to make a status about the, what's new in uh, 01. So first of all, uh, we added the architecture chapter, uh, summing up the, um, how the lower one is mapping to uh, LP1 entities. So on that, on that part, on that chapter, we suggest where the chic uh, compressor, decompressor, and the chic fragmentation should be performed. So on the figure, you see this is a typical uh, lower one uh, architecture network. So with the and devices uh, who, which are uh, running the chic compressor, decompressor. Uh, then we have a transparent uh, gateways and network server for, uh, for our case, and the chic compression, decompression, and fragmentation should be also held in the application server right on the, on the right hand side. So this is typical lower one, and this is where we are intending to put the, the chic layers on top. Uh, so what is next, what, what we are discussing together is uh, the lower one, uh, chic role are being defined. So we are uh, right now working on a one IPv6 UDP with zero bytes, uh, zero bits sent on the wire. So the goal here is to prove that the technology is really compressing the payloads. Uh, all, all the fields on that, on those rules are not sent. Um, uh, other rules are defined for co-op, so IPv6 UDP co-op for uplink and downlink post. Uh, uh, same thing for gets. So uh, we are trying to describe how to do a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, co-op uh, connection with a with a remote server. Uh, on the fragmentation part, we are also uh, uh, defining uh, parameters. So we have three types of uh, fragmentation parameters. One for is for uplinks, which are different constraints uh, as for the downlinks, and the downlinks has been separated in two parts. So in lower one, you do have a downlink class A, which is for uh, very constrained devices, which are not listening all the time, but only opening a listening window after a transmission. So the fragmentation here is, is must be adapted for, for such a case. And the downlink for class B and C, so class B is for uh, devices which are listening periodically, and class C is for uh, constant listening devices. So there the fragmentation can be a bit more relaxed and because we can, we can address the device uh, directly. So that's why we, we did a specific uh, case for that. Uh, my final slide is what we intend to do as a LoRa Alliance uh, goal. What, as, as I said, what we want to do is to do an HTTP post from an end device. This, is, this would be the result of a good uh, chic usage on the LoRa Alliance uh, or LoRa One uh, network um, demonstration. Uh, Dominic Martel, uh, HTT post from end device. What do you mean? Which is the end device? I mean, on the internet, on the lower one network? Okay, by on, HTTP is that on, on the on the lower one nomenclature? End devices are the small uh, things which are running on the radio link. So that's like your uh, your device with the Semtech radio. Do you uh, mean co-op? You, you wrote HTTP. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the final goal is to to have a conversion between co-op and HTTP at the end. So the, the idea in the air is to make the UN device post something to Amazon Web Services. OK, right? so it's HTTP on the network side and co-op on the device side. That's right, yeah. So not quite end-to-end -end HTTP. Well, yeah. I mean, OK, we, I understand what you mean. OK, thank you. So what we foresee uh, as, a, as a group is that to do that m more uh, in an easy fashion, what we would need is a chic role file format to be loaded on our uh, application server or on a chic compressor decompressor. That would mean that the, um, the role could be, could be provisioned as a device profile um, thing, and that would make the, all the application server defined in the, in the lower one uh, compatible with each other, and then we we do we do have compatibility uh, end to end. So then the chic is, is really a standard as a Laura Allen's uh, Laura One application server. So that's it. Thank you. Very Juan good. Carl quick, quick uh, Juan Carlos, one, one question. Uh, so just to 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 confirm or, or or understand the question from from Dominica, 
in in this uh, in the group you you are not planning to to have something like uh, http over over chic or something you you no, you would no rely sorry on the... yeah i i see it's confusing so we want to do co-op from the end device to the to the application server uh, going out with chic and then co-op to http after that as it's done yeah. in the yeah i know i know but HTTP the final the big picture is uh, yeah. my device is posting its temperature uh, sensing to the cloud okay thanks that's that's the goal and conceptually, we uh, often have a proxy of some form at the compressor because some numbers have to be matched and things like that. So the proxy can be a very simple proxy which do puts the right numbers from the short numbers and things like that. Or it could go all the way to an HTTP to go up proxy. In this case, you would go all the way. If it works. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And so I think we'll be, Thank you. Uh, we, we are addressing some of these things in the um, rechartering discussion on the end. So thanks very much for actually bringing these points here. Perfect. Suresh, we, um, if, if the frame is fragmented, then we've got a, a very large checksum because we have, we are checksumming the, all the fragments together. And we also have the, the quote unquote checksum of LoRa at the end of the frame. Now, if, if the frame is very small, it's just you no know, one packet feels feels in one frame. Then the unchecksum we get is the LoRa checksum, and we elide the UDP checksum. So that's going to be always this discussion. Just make you aware. But it's it's it, the case where it looks weaker than with a UDP checksum in line. Is for very very small frames. So, is can we prove that the uh, LoRa checksum is good enough to elide to, to the UDP checksum in for that very small frame? That will be the, the, the discussion. I, I answer this question. So, I think you need to write it up because um, when we did the UDP checksum zero for v6, right? Like we had to like say, okay, this is going to be the bit error rate and these other things, kind of things. Like you could, you, you, there could be cases where like you know the UDP port could get changed in transit and like might not get detected. Those kind of things. I think we need to do the same thing because I personally think the applicability statement we have today for UDP zero checksum doesn't apply here because that was like really meant only for tunnel endpoints. So you're saying. We, we already have an exception there because if in six low band, we already elide the UDP checksum because we claim that we have additional MIC in the messages which give us the same strength. So at the end of the day, it just placed somewhere else. And as you, but but this is because we have the same strengths globally. I I, I think it's because it came before this issue came up. Really? No, no, it came after. It was right after. It was a, the same time frame as as the tunnel thing. But and it passed. I mean, it's RFC sixty. Well, we'll, okay, we'll yeah, the, so this is like the RFC that. seven something, I think. So 60, like twenty one, which okay. is discussing that. Okay, we can we, we can talk about it uh, offline. I think your awareness That's because your awareness. Um, I I think if something is written up already for this, it's okay. If not, we need to write something up for it. We cannot just like do the analysis internally and just leave it because we at some point like um, somebody from the transport area will say like, hey, no, how, how is this gonna work? So we need to either point to some existing document like where it's been done or write something up. And I really think we need to write it up because I'm not sure there's existing justification for this. So point it out if you, have, if you, if you know of something, we can look at it. Well, 60 to 82 has the same description, but yes, we'll take it offline. Okay. So just on to corroborate on this point, I think that could be a useful input for ticket 15. Now I think I'm going to remember this ticket. So ticket 15 for technology dependent documents to write up that the, the authors must provide, must ensure that the checksum of the technology is strong enough to fulfill this or provide some justification about this. So this way, pe yes, the people from, yeah, we need to have a discussion right, on but, the specific but, but technology. But that's not sufficient. So mm. uh, my thinking is this, like the link layer technology provides like checksum for that hop, right? But if, you, if you're going past that hop, like where UDP is supposed to be. So like we are trying to relax, if we can relax it for a specific, one hop thing, it's different than saying, like, I'm going to relax this for UDP, right? Because UDP runs over the internet. You cannot say, like, hey, my Ethernet checksum is good enough, right? But otherwise, people, that's the original argument. People say, hey, my Ethernet checksum is good enough, but what happens if, like, you know, a router cut up something, right? So that, so, like, we need to think from the perspective. We cannot just say, like, hey, if the link layer is good enough, we can do it. So that, we need to be careful. Let's actually do the work and yes. see how things Let's go. Let's go okay. offline, Let's but we need to do the work. Okay.
with this, Juan yeah. Carlos. Okay. Presenters. So, hello everyone, Juan Carlos Zuniga, Sigfox, uh, and I'm going to talk about the Shikover Sigfox uh, update. So again, uh, it's an early draft, uh, not much content so far, but uh, a lot of uh, discussions and uh, testing going on in behind the scenes. Uh, so what we are trying to do is optimize the parameters uh, that we have um, to define now that we know ticket 15 will be the, uh, our reference. So basically we are trying to answer ticket 15 even before it's been created. So uh, what the draft describes is a network architecture, similar what uh, uh, was described before for, for Laura, uh, the chic rules uh, and the fragmentation. And of course, we're trying to optimize as much as possible because of the, the small payloads. So uh, a quick uh, mm. reminder also, the generic architecture on the right-hand side, uh, we talk about radio gateways, network gateways, uh, servers and applications, and the, the CFOX network architecture, because we have all the base stations connected to, to the single cloud. Uh, the output of the cloud is uh, indeed HTTP. And, and therefore, we have to adapt differently. So uh, any chic compression, the, co the compression uh, function would be after the, this cloud, and therefore implemented uh, after the callback of, of the cloud. Still TBD, whether the cloud will, will provide a, a chic specific uh, uh, API or, or connector or not, but so far it's a HTTP. Uh, and the device, of course, is, is open so for the, the implementer. So, uh, where we're putting attention in this uh, over the past uh, few weeks and at the hackathon is on the optimization of the rules for the most common uh, type of uh, Sigfox LP1 applications. So that was part of the, the, the questions I was asking the, the, the rule ID uh, uh, size and the rule ID uh, world, because we do want to optimize and, and make sure that we can use this, the, the minimum number of rule IDs to, to, to optimize this space. Um, uh, as you as you know, and, and we we talked about, we have this 12 byte op, uh, uplink payload size that is variable. That could be one bit or, or multiple bytes, uh, but but variable to 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 optimize the size of the packet. On the down on the downlink, we have this eight byte uh, constant uh, payload that uh, it's uplink uh, triggered. So pretty much similar to the class A uh, LoRa one uh, mode. And uh, of course, we need to optimize the, the padding again to to make sure that the 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 messages are uh, consume as little energy as possible. So uh, again, this is post hackathon. Uh, my hope is to 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 start providing some recommendations for the next uh, for the next uh, uh, version of the document, uh, specifying th those parameters, optimizing them for the for the better usage. And uh, it's uh, ongoing work. So if you are interested in contributing, please let us know. So far, we have a good number of people uh, trying this out and trying to come up with the best. Uh, recommendations. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Juan Carlos. So, and Edgar. Thank you. I'm Edgar Ramos. Uh, I work in Ericsson and uh, together with Anna and um, Sorti we are uh, starting this uh, draft which is saying that uh, uh, Six Fox draft is basically uh, just the beginning we is a container there is not that much text on it but then I wanted to present just some of the issues that we will have to deal with uh, when we are uh, working in this draft some of the things has to do with the peculiarities, if we want to call it like that, of narrowband IoT, and how it's different with respect to the other technologies. And then uh, there are some architectural issues uh, that I have called. Uh, one of them is the different transmission modes. So basically, in narrowband IoT, you could have different ways of transmitting data, depending on the um, state that the terminal is, if it's in a connected state, or is it just starting the transmission, or it has been connected, but then it went to, to power saving mode. <clears throat> then we have also, uh, also it depends on the configuration of the operator, so how the operator uh, managed that uh, terminal. So remember that narrow IoT so far is uh, over license spectrum, so it, the operator has a lot of um, even legal responsibility over how it is handled those connections. 
Uh, the better handling has to do pretty much with the same of the transmission modes. Since they are different transmission modes, uh, the UE might, I mean, the, the equipment might go from one mode to another. And um, so that is more effective depending on the, let's say, the buffer size that is for the data that is going to be transmitted. So then it might be changes that you start in one transmission mode and then you switch to the next one, which is optimized. Um, the other thing that uh, Narrowman IoT is quite strong or is one of the strengths is the mobility. And in, here I'm not only talking about mobility in one network, but also you have to think about mobility from roaming. So when uh, UE suddenly wake up in another country and it has to attach and have data to send. Uh, this is, for example, a use case for containers which might have sensors and are traveling in the sea or by, by plane. And finally, uh, there is a possibility that we could also include uh, cases for LTM that has been specified very recently. Uh, it's a type of terminal uh, for LTE, which is also uh, a targeting uh, a machine type communication. Um, and then uh, also 5G NR, so the new radio uh, uh, MTC, which there is not so much yet, but it's starting some work already of uh, what would be uh, used for, for machine type communication. Then the idea, well, this is about a little bit more detail about the transmission mode, if anyone is interested. And uh, you could say that there are this kind of these two types of transmission, the data over NAS and the, and the connected mode. And the difference is that the way how the lower layers protocols works, um, in, in, for example, in data over NAS, uh, they are very, very much deactivated. So there is where Cheek could work pretty much with all the features. So there you could have fragmentation. There you could have um, uh, you could have the 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 full uh, set of, of 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 features. Meanwhile, in the connected mode, there is encryption uh, in PDCP. Well, I can show a little bit this this figure, which is the architecture, uh, and then the two stacks. So um, which one it is? So for the data over NAS, you will have this stack. Basically, uh, even when you have PDCP and RLC, RLC is a, is a is a layer layer two. Uh, well, we don't say that it's layer two, but something between layer two and layer three uh, protocol that that could handle um, um, reliability. So you could configure it to be reliable or not. For narrowband IoT, now in release 15, they are including non-reliability because it was uh, for release 13 and, and 14, uh, was only uh, use reliable. So, but now there are some cases like streaming where you might not need to have uh, acknowledge it. So then there are now for release 15, bringing it on. Um, then you have Mac, which uh, have a hard protocol. So it means that you have automatic retransmissions and that is configured by the operator, how many retransmissions want to have. And even when there is some sort of reliability, uh, depending on the channel quality, so those packets might be lost. And then basically you have two, two layers of reliability in the connected mode, which is, which is uh, what you have here. So here these two provides reliability. And also RLC provides uh, fragmentation or segmentation, as we call it. So that means that in the connected mode, uh, the fragmentation wouldn't be needed. Now, um, because the, uh, this architecture, it means that you would have to have for each of the, of the modes different placement for the compressor and the compressor. So basically, you would have uh, one compressor that works uh, for connected mode in PDCP level here, and then for the uh, data over NAS, you will have it basically here. Um, so these are things that we need to consider. And then again, how you switch from one mode, so you are transmitted in this mode, and then you get upgraded, let's say like that, to connected mode, and then what happened, how that transition is. Is done is something that we have to think as well. Um, 
Additionally to that, well, there is basically ticket 15 <laughs> 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 that uh, I have copy paste some of the parameters that were already there, which we have to take care. And the padding treatment, uh, we also have padding treatment in layer two uh, for the connected mode, which means that uh, maybe we don't even want to have padding at all um, for, for SHIC. I mean, the padding will be handled by the lower layers. And then this thing of the rule ID. So what happens if there is uh, no fragmentation or there is no compression, and then is it really adding uh, then uh, overhead and how you handle that? Uh, I think it's very important to have this uh, possibility that it can be variable or it can be defined in some way how the rule ID size or, or, or how it is uh, marked. So it can be that if you start with one, then you have to read something else. If you start with zero, then you know there is no compression. But well, that's something to look at as well. Um, and that's all I have, I think. It's a great start. Uh, Juan Carlos, can you go? Sorry. So a very quick one, Juan Carlos. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll ask uh, both uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, for the connected mode, uh, well, I, I assume uh, the CO uh, uh, covers both LTEM and NBIOT. Okay, so and then the question is for the connected mode. Uh, are you plan? Uh, is is the idea to have some IP in IP, or or, or are the IPs uh, completely independent, or how do you match that? Yeah, that's a good question because, um, of course, if we do this in in let's say PDCP, this means that it has to be standardized in 3GPP, and then in that case, uh, you would use the IP of of the terminal, which is the one that is given by by the, the packet gateway. If not, then we have to think if it's possible to use it in other way, but I, I'm not sure at this point. I cannot really okay. answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. thanks very much, Edgar. Thanks very much. So we move on with, with uh, ICMP. And, and this one. Today we have a lot of duos that are presenting. That's good. Very, very fast. Okay, uh, I'm Diego Duhovne, uh, and I'm one of the uh, I'm the co-author of, of the draft from the uh, ICMPv6 uh, ICMPv6. Okay, then uh, what do you want? Um, we have published. Oh. Okay, we go. Um, and in this version, we have built a new version, uh, a new rule. Okay, since. Uh, um, at the beginning, okay, we, we started with this variable length, okay, and then we were told we, we should keep the, the rule ID as a whole thing. Then we can go back now to the to the length which was already uh, shortened depending on the number of bits. Um, then, since we are we were implementing for for the ICMPv6 on LoRa, in, in, in fact, okay, we have uh, the specific message there as an example, and then we are building a LoRa gateway table, okay, just to uh, um, specifically in LoRa in this case, okay, because we are implementation works on this, and then we are going to go up there, up there, and upstairs maybe, and define how, how it will work as a proxy, and. Um, well, on the on, on the on SCHC, okay, we are uh, avoiding the checksum, okay, because we are relaying on the packet CRC itself, and you are in fact using the the comp compression table for the other for the other types of of, mm. of uh, packets we are using on CMPv6. And okay, the, the the other thing, okay, we are trying to redesign the strategy, in fact, to reduce the number of packets. Okay, that's the, the idea we are going through. Okay, maybe uh, most of the of, of the work on on CMP6 should be on the proxy side. Just that. Okay. Okay, and still on ICMP uh, group, another group wrote a draft uh, before Singapore on uh, ICMP as well. Okay, not working. Next slide, please. Alex. Okay. Um, so what did we do since IGF 100? Uh, we have not advanced the draft at all due to lack of time and time spent on other things. But we did prototype uh, ping proxy on the server side. So we had a demo recently where we showed we could ping uh, LP1 device uh, from the outside 
uh, and have, have the proxy respond on behalf of the device and we chose to implement a simple time threshold. If the device has been seen for the last 10 minutes, the proxy will respond uh, with an echo reply, otherwise it will not. So that, that's one of the proposed behaviors uh, for uh, ping. Um, we've been discussing with Diego to on merging the two drafts for since Singapore. We haven't done that yet, but we know what, what's in each other's draft. In this draft, we're interested in uh, RC4443, which is only the ping and trace route uh, behavior, not so much for 861. And I know the chairs have a surprise for us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me. Okay, thank you very much. So, do you have any questions or else, like one question maybe, please? It's not about this draft, but I wanted to just announce that um, the in IEEE 802 wireless, there is now an LPWA group. It's been approved, and we've set uh, some in, uh, project uh, goals for the group, and one of them is to have a uh, header compression draft for that for 802.15. On four, depending, well, it could depend on various uh, uh, things. But I just would invite any, if anybody here is interested in uh, uh, joining that effort, we're definitely interested. I presented about the SCHC at the recent meeting of 802 Wireless, and there was interest in that. Sounds perfect. So we'll be looking for another presentation for the next ITF and another submission. Thanks. Uh, so, Rish Krishnan, so just to uh, Dominic, so you said no 4861, but that's a legal type in 4443. So you're going to just go for a smaller subset of types that you want to compress? Is, is that the goal? Because I, I didn't understand that statement. Right. Right. Like the, the ND messages are legal ICMP messages, right? Right, right. Uh, okay. I meant only those ones that are defined explicitly in 4441. 4441 does not preclude the other ones, but. Okay. Um, what I, what I meant is that's a type of messages we are interested in this draft. Okay. Uh, not to say that. Okay. Right. Okay. So, like, so if I understand you correctly, you want to take a subset of codes that are in the INR registry right. and compress them. The rest of the ones. I think um, if you remember last meeting, uh, we this draft is also about use cases. Why do we need that? What what situations are we looking at? And and. Not just compressing things and sending them over the wire, but what kind of ex uh, behavior do we expect? If a request comes from the internet to the device, shall we transfer that to the device or respond as a proxy? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the draft is uh, discussing all those situations more than providing compression, and Diego's draft provides the compression details. Okay. So, uh, no, but the thing was like, you know, I was talking to Alex a little bit before. Uh, maybe like you know, six or seven years ago, like we were thinking of doing new ICMP types, like mm -hmm. for supporting this IoT stuff. So one of the things was um, um, I, I started writing up something which said like if you are on a cellular link somewhere and the device is on a sleep cycle, right? You would send a different ICMP message back than the regular ICMP messages. So I'm, so I I would really like to see like instead of saying only 44, 43, to have like a listed set of like ICMP types that we want to compress and do each one separately. So it, it's okay. like it's not a big difference, but I want to like not restrict it by what is in 4443, but rather say we look at a subset of ICMP types. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Well, we'll discuss that at the Richarder because that's exactly the topic anyway. So. Perfect. So I think that uh, yeah. So we're out of battery. Yeah, we're out of battery. So the, the we, too many slides today. You know the batteries are out. So I'm going to do this in uh, two three minutes. But it's super important to prepare for what is going to come. And this is uh, data models uh, for Shake. So basically, how do we do the uh, how th that's an issue that we a question that we we'll need to answer here at some point. And this point is coming very very rapidly. So uh, Pascal, next slide, please. So uh, we need this because we need to be able to have interoperability and to express this context, uh, you know, among the devices, among the network elements, and you know, among the different technologies. So we have this beautiful table, and there are some beautiful values out there. Next slide. 
so today what we have is we have some ad hoc JavaScript, uh, sorry, ad hoc JSON uh, description, something like this, uh, that works pretty well. Uh, but uh, the thing is, you know, uh, that we uh, will need to go a little a step further and really formalize this thing. Next step, next, yeah. So today what we are doing is, well, we have the device and on the other side, you know, the thing that uh, here is called client. So we have the context that today are pre-provisioned and this way it works. Next slide. And today these are pre-provisioned and what we'll need to have is the way to do the, uh, to, the uh, to enable discovery of how uh, uh, the client or the device, you know, is going, the, the client at least is going to discover what the device is. Uh, is able to support and what is what are the contexts on it. Uh, also be able to do runtime modifications, uh, minor modifications, if this is necessary, right? We need to have the mechanism, which is not obligatory to be had in all technologies or in all devices, but we need to have this thing in mind and we need to have this technology. Uh, and we'll end up with more things about this. So next slide, then we need to have this puts us in the, in the position that we need to have a schema for how we are going to be presenting this context, right? To be able to validate all that stuff. And at some point we'll need to have this pro like protocol for the exchanges between the two so that they're able to do this runtime. Next. So one point, one possibility is to go with Yang. And here I'm really sorry, Pascal, but I, I, I try to have animation. So we'll need, you'll need to press a couple of times. So we have netconf, go ahead, go ahead. And in netconf we have this, and in uh, and in restconf and in comi. So if we have the Yang module, the Yang model, then you have the, re the representation and have the expression of XML in JSON and in Cbor. How you are going to be able to express the context? So you have one we have one schema that uh, for the for the context, and we have all these representations and protocol bindings. So. Uh, there is all already a solution, Yang and Kamai, and it works really well. And we are not going to start from uh, um, from scratch. So there has already been a submission. Uh, I think it could be a good starting point, and this is something to 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 look at. It is not the only way to do it, and that's a thing for us to uh, study as a working group to decide pretty rapidly. So we have a starting point. We have something that could work really well. And the alternatives are basically we can go with raw JSON as it is for the moment and say, well, now this is the structure that we expect to be, and that's it. We can do it with CBOR. We can imagine some binary encoding, and we can use CDDL to do the validation and so forth. Uh, and we can also go the road of defining our protocol on the on the chic level to say, well, you know, these are the exchanges, and this way, you know, we put some configuration and so forth. So these are alternatives. But the point here is that we'll need this document, and right now when we're nearing up the, the, the finalizing of Schick, uh, then it, it is the time to, to look at this. So that will be the next point. Uh, so if you are willing to contribute and to, uh, and to uh, yes, you can switch to the next presentation if you want. Uh, if you're willing to contribute and if you're willing to, to, to look into this, now is the right time. So there is already a, a, a way to go, but that's a thing to, to discuss on the mailing list. And um, any question? No. Yes. Do you have any questions or any remarks on this? Yep. Julien from Kelling. So, uh, as I said in my presentation, I fully support such uh, such initiative. Thank you. Perfect. You will be very happy to 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 work on this. And Peter. Uh, Peter van der Stok. I will be very pleased to see some consequences of the choice. What will be the sizes of the files, etc. Because when you optimize by hand, you can come to better results, possibly. It's maybe more work, but uh, I would like to see something like that. OK, thank you. Yes, uh, Peter, most of this exchange is not to go over the LP1 itself, right? It's, it stays on the, not on the network. So um, mm. probably the size is not as critical. It could be important, but not as critical as if it was flying all the time over the, the, the air, right? Okay. I, I think we will need to have some mech so that that's that's an all these are open questions right okay. I think that we'll need to have some protocol or something that is able to to that we're able to configure some values of the of the chic context so mm -hmm. not okay. provision the whole context so if but was, be able to do okay. fine configurations like okay I have the whole I have the context with some rules and some of the rules I have a value that I want to configure for this device I need okay. to tell this device okay. so, so that's if you understand thing. correctly, so the advantage is the ease of specification, what you're looking for. 
uh, sorry, can you repeat this? I didn't yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Peter van der Stok. So as the, the, what you're looking for, the, the discriminating factor is the ease of specification. The ease of specification. Uh, hmm. The language so is choice makes it possible to specify a certain structures and hmm. complexity and other languages do not allow that. And you have a certain text and, 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 uh, that you have to write. And so for some uh, languages yeah. you have small text to get lots of results and others you have to write a lot to get little results. So these are the criteria, hmm. is that correct? I, I would say so, and I okay. would say also the ease of defining the protocol bindings that okay. enable you to do um, minor okay. additions, mi minor patches, let's say, mm -hmm. to the to the to the context on the two okay. to the on two ends, but also that doesn't uh, put big fr frontiers to large scale di uh, dissemination of these contexts. Thank you. Yep. Ari Keran and Ericsson um, on the options for different formats please not let let's not invent new ones <laughs> so definitely use one of the existing ones cbor probably good starting point and as you mentioned on the fetching and patching part you know there's a bunch of interesting work done in core also so let's see what are the synergies there what can, how can we reuse the mechanisms that we are using elsewhere mm. that will be perfect oh, thanks thank you very much Ari. And so um, we are getting into in the last part of uh, this talk, and I'll try to do really, really quick on this one. So uh, we are, as as you see, we are nearing up the uh, the, the fulfillment and the completion of uh, our initial charter items, um, or you, we might have some of them. So next slide, please. And so these are our two main charter items that we have today. The first one, that is the LP1 overview, is fulfilling it, and. The second uh, charter item that we are that is actually we 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 took really a lot of time with with Pascal and and we looked deep down in it in the state where we are and we actually identified that we were a little bit ambitious when we specified it so the chic over IP chic for UDP IP um, document is fulfilling the part that is in green but then we have still the chic for co-op so we would like to make this a new work item so in the in the future rechartering um, and then we have a new work item that is to include the definition of the data models so the data models are things that uh, that uh, i just talked about so these will be two separate work items and we'll have a third one which is the 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 technology specific documents for which we talked about today uh, the LoRaWAN, the sigfox uh, the the nbiot and the future uh, YSAN. So these will be three charter items. So here we have a proposed text that is basically reflecting getting the previous text, striking out the things that were done, and uh, just splitting this in these three uh, work items. So these things would be sent uh, over the mailing list also, so that we can uh, take a read them, uh, like taking a reading of them, if in case you have any uh, any comment about this. So that will be this. And well, I'm staying, thank you. Um, so, you know, we've got this work that uh, Dominique and uh, uh, Diego just, just presented right now, uh, on which we are looking if we could derive an actual work item which would make sense. And as, as, was, as was discussed earlier, we don't want to make an, an exercise of uh, trying to compress ICMP as a whole. We want to have a real use case and a real operation which is useful for the network. And um, we, we considered that uh, OAM is actually an important function for the network, being able to, to go to the device or go near the device and check the network condition, whether the device is alive, whether the network is alive, uh, what's going on. And so we figured that actually the, the, the work item behind the work, which was done by Diego and Dominic, was really OAM and some to, to be defined exactly what we'll do, but uh, taking ping as a reference. And so that's what we wanted to turn into a new work item. So that would be the only new work actually in the charter. So we would take, a, we, we complete, as we said, the LP1 overview, we, we, we will have completed the shake and around that time, we'd like to be able to, to have a chartered item around the work which is done on AAM. That's pretty much where we are. Suresh. Uh, Suresh Krishnan. So it sounds good. And uh, one other thing I would like is like a milestone update. Like, you know, it still has dates in May 2017 or something. So like, just do like a more realistic one because it's not going to be met. So yeah. uh, that... uh, probably not. <laughs> so, okay. Yes, uh, we'll yeah, do that. We'll propose you changes. No, as after this something one. reasonable because I want to. Like one of the things that's happening is like the telechats are getting like really, really full. So we have like thousand page telechats and stuff and it's very difficult. So I, I, I would really like some heads up on 
when you expect things to get me right Sweet. and so if if you update the milestones on at least the co-op because i have like no clue how far off it is like udp ip is pretty close but co-op i have no clue like how far out it is okay, so, so on on uh, okay so we'll, we'll we'll do this and we, we got the message that we need to finish the the we need to deliver the chic for ip udp before we do any rechartering so that's really important for us to to, fi to finish this uh, this work in time and that's the first point on a chic over co for co-op basically um there has been no advancement because uh we need like a co-op is such a huge thing, thing. So either we will make such a very generic compressor that will be complex and uh, maybe too just too uh, taking too much power and and so forth. So the discussions were to uh, recharter to to include it in the next charter so that so that we can have so that we can have input from uh, different users of co-op and that the, the, the authors of the, the, the draft can actually um, yes. profile it. That's fine. So but, like, but if, the... it's, if it's, say it's not before 2019, that's OK. Right? Like, I just take an estimate on mm -hmm. it. And so just to see how I can, because there's yeah. multiple working groups that I have. So I need to make sure that I can plan for it. OK. okay? Yeah. So, Very good. And so we have five minutes for a, any other business. So. Question, any other business, anything you want to discuss? Otherwise, you'll be first in queue for food. Oh, one, one more ticket, one more ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so blue sheets. Um, did you, did everybody in this room sign the blue sheets? Oh, please, where are the blue sheets? Please bring, please send them back from the bottom to the, to the front. In a, uh, oh, no. <laughs> in full form, please. Okay, thank you all, and have a great uh, day at this end. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Dominique, Anna, wow. You did, you did such fantastic work with the slides. Wow. And they were coming light, you know, I was kind of anxious, but man, <laughs> such good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.